Welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Boyson, the host of Inside Personal Growth. And we have Remy Blumenfeld joining us from Kent, England, actually, a uh, little part south of um, London, he was telling me, kind of his way to get away from all the people and COVID and challenges and so on. Good day to you, Remy. How are you doing? I'm very well. Thank you, Greg. How are you? I'm doing really well. And most of my listeners know that I live in a little city called Encinitas, California. Uh, today, very foggy. We don't mind because it's a break from the heat. Um, and it's wonderful. And, you know, for my listeners, Remy, I always tell them a little bit about um, our authors, even though one of my questions for you is to tell our listeners about you. But the reality is, is that there is more to you than meets the eye. So that's what I intuit, and I think my listeners need to know. So uh, Remy Blumenfeld is one of the world-leading business coaches, contributing more than 50 articles to Forbes uh, magazine, has been the most influential LGBTQ people in the United Kingdom. He's been in the Times, the Sunday Times. Uh, his clients include, uh, they're just many, many, many people. He, in his late 20s, when he was working as a TV producer, and as a result of that British channel, he became off air overnight. He was out of work and broke. So Remy started his first business from his bedroom in a crime-ridden area in London. Uh, he had no previous experience running a company, uh, eight years later, he was happy to report he sold his first company in a high multiple to the world's largest production company. We're going to get to hear a little bit about that story um, because Remy's is not only about the success there. I want Remy to tell us his story about a near-death experience or an illness that he had as well. And on the way, he had to learn a lot about what it takes to build and grow a business driven by ideas. Uh, that someone will one day want to buy. And I think the key for Remy is he's been involved in a lot of merger transactions of businesses. Remy has created this program called Stand Out, which we're going to be talking about today. It's a nine-part course for founders because he says he so wished that somebody had given him this resource when he launched his first company. Um, he uses his decades of experience to support and guide founders of content-driven companies. So I want to make that distinguishing factor here. Uh, his companies were content-driven companies, and he'll tell you what that is. His journey has been a life-challenging experience, and his goal is to share his experience. Now, Remy, you know, I know I told our listeners a little bit about you, but there's more about you than what was in that little bit of bio that I said. And I would like for you to embellish upon that and why this standout course at this time. You know, look, you're later in your career, kind of like me. And here we are, um, people who want to share the wisdom. Why did you feel that this was so important now, and especially with this crazy COVID thing? going on well isn't it strange how the universe conspires with our plan so I had always intended to launch an online course in September 2020 I just had no idea that September 2020 would look and feel like it does and part of that is that many people including my clients and my target audience are spending much more time at home than I thought they would be when I launched the course I coach most of my clients remotely anyway. I have clients across the States, in Sweden and Holland, and even Australia. And we do video coaching much as we're doing uh, now in this conversation. So the idea of an online course was not entirely removed from the mm -hmm. core of my business. The reason that I wanted to launch this course was because I discovered through coaching many founders over a couple of years Essentially, they all required the same nine modules. And I didn't know that going into coaching them, but actually there are some blind spots, some aspects of being human, some parts of leadership, which all of us require coaching on. And so I've distilled these nine 
essential areas and deliver them as nine program nine modules in my program and that's what standout is it's offering to everyone in this content space which i'll describe in a minute the same opportunities that i deliver to my clients one-on-one -on -one. well and we're going to put links in the blog to all the places that our listeners will need to go to actually find your course and to find all that and you know you, I said early on that you had written a lot of articles. It was over 50 articles for Forbes magazine. And I read the one uh, that you gave me the link to. And you wrote this article about how business owners need to let go of kind of the grips of fear, you know, it, with COVID. And what advice do you have for our listeners about the pandemic and the fear that may have fallen in their it, it possessed them, let's say, as a result of this pandemic, because, you know, it's a real thing. It's real in London. It's real in California. It's real worldwide, right? It's very real. The issue is, you know, when people get gripped in fear, Remy, they contract. And contraction isn't about how businesses grow. It's about how businesses shrink. Uh, so what I want to get out from you is, what advice would you real, just down heart to heart advice you'd give our listeners? Well, what you said is so true. When, we, when we're afraid, we contract, we shrink. And that is counter to risk taking and it's counter to growth. And I'm not just talking about growth of your profit or growth of your turnover. I'm talking about growth of an idea, growth of yourself, growth of experience so i think what's been quite interesting is i've also been coaching over the last few months some founders of very new businesses businesses that have just launched in the midst of covid and what these founders have that i think we could all learn from is a few things one they're really clear that they want to create a business that they love now all of us, when we first founded our business many years ago, created a business that resonated with us, that we loved. And yet, I'm sure for many of us in the intervening years, events have taken over, the market has taken over, we've ended up perhaps in a role in our business that isn't as satisfying as, or exciting as the role we started out with. We may even have ended up creating content or products or services which don't speak as much to us as it did when we first launched. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a real opportunity in reframing our business to look at what is the business we would really love to be in charge of now, not just now, but for the next five or 10 years. And that obviously is something which, which founders of new businesses are engaging with. They're doing something they love. So this is an opportunity to do something you love. I think it's also an opportunity to be of service because founders of companies in the midst of COVID are very clear about the community that they're serving. And the community they're serving may not be directly aligned to their product, but it's who they as founders want to show up for in the world. So once you've asked yourself, what do I love doing? What do I love making? What would I be proud of delivering for the next five years? I think it's also important to say, who do I want to be helping? Who do I want to be serving? in the world and be very clear about that as you move forward. I think it's a really important point you make. I mean, in all the business leadership courses, they talk about vision and purpose and purpose being, you know, your why. Okay. And I think the important point is, is that the uh, young people coming up today have more of an intense focus on it. And we're going to talk about focus because that's a big thing you know, getting distracted by all of these other things that you could do really does not help a business grow the way you want it. And you have experience from that, both from a positive side and a negative side uh, that happened to you. But you also had something happen to you that you mentioned to me that wasn't anywhere in here and that you had this life-threatening illness and that the experience shifted your perspective about life and business. What's your personal perspective? And what do entrepreneurs out there today having just started a business or maybe been in a business for a while need to learn from your story 
Well, I was very fortunate in that I got to confront my mortality when I was in my 20s. So I don't think most people actually confront the fact that life, a human life is a thousand months until they're at the end of a thousand months. Even when I say that to people, they're usually quite shocked that a human life is only a thousand months. And yet the average human lifespan in the West is 73 years and 73 years is exactly 1000 months. Mm -hmm. So I got to confront that young and what I came away from that experience realizing Greg was that my awards, my achievements, the money in the bank, everything I'd made was completely unimportant. And I know that obviously sounds strange when, when we're in the midst of running a business where the needs of the people and the business seem huge and overwhelming. And yet when you face your mortality, all that matters is who you love and who loves you. That's Dalai and, Lama 101. You know, who, who have you helped? Who have you loved? And who's loved you? And in the end, when you're on your deathbed, there is no, you know, none of us have any difference there, right? Meaning, you know, you're not taking the money with you, right? Uh, you're not taking the possessions with you. Um, but we have such an attachment to that. We think that they're so important. Uh, but the reality is at 20 years old, um, I related to your story because my son got chronic myelogenous leukemia at 21. And I was relating because as a father, I was looking at what he was going through mentally as well. So I get that, that your story had a profound impact um, spiritually for you and the way in which you guided the rest of your life. You know, I've seen young people this happen to. My son, it, same thing with you. It, it, it isn't about money for him, even though he's hugely successful. It isn't about any of that. It's about his freedom. Um, and I think for somebody like you, even it's a guy like you has found freedom, you know. Um, so tell people how they can get that freedom. <laughs> well, so I think... It, Obviously, I, I had this awareness before having the experience. And I think you pointing to the Dalai Lama's words illustrate the fact that many of us know this, but we don't internalize it, we don't feel it. We, we understand it on some level. But let me just share one very short story that perhaps will deliver the impact that my story alone or your son's story alone doesn't give. There's a woman called Bronnie Ware, who was a palliative care nurse for many years working with the end of life journeys of hundreds of men and women she was the woman who sat by their bedside as they were in their last days and weeks and she was there holding their hand and she wrote a book called five regrets of the dying because what she discovered was that in our final moments on earth we all all human beings have the same fundamental regrets we wish we had had more fun and been more playful and been more joyous. We wish we had spent less time at the office and more time at home. We wish we had connected more profoundly with the people who we love. And when you think about those essential universal regrets of all dying people on this planet, surely you don't want to be one of them. And when you're looking at this place from a little bit down the track, it gives you an opportunity to reframe because, and let's face it, if you're on your deathbed regretting that you spent too little time with your people you love, that's a little too late. So any moment that you have to address that beforehand is a plus. And I think particularly uh, at this really challenging time around COVID, recognizing that if you have your health, if you have your life itself, if you have your sanity, and a little solvency, you're so way ahead of everyone else on this planet who's come before you because you're alive and you're healthy. So celebrating that and using that as an occasion to reframe and decide what you want to do next, I think is hugely important and perhaps gives you the opportunity to be a little bit more playful or experimental or risk-taking because we're only here for a thousand months and most of your listeners, such as myself, don't have a thousand months left 
you know, we've got a couple of hundred months. So why not fill that being of service to others, living a life that is joyous for ourselves and creating fun and joy and connection. You know, it, when you talk about that, and it's a side story, my listeners may have heard this once, but I don't think I've told it more than once. But I go to a meditation retreat on a little place called the Orcas Islands, and we spend seven days in long, long meditations, three days in complete silence. And the leader of this is uh, Dr. Joel Levy, and many, many people know him. And he used to have these monks that would come to him over from Tibet. And they'd say, well, what do you want? You know, you're here in Seattle. And they'd say, I want to get a watch because they never were wearing a watch. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, a watch? Why do you want a watch? Right. And, and they used to put a, a skeleton on top of their bed, their bedpost. And they said, well, so when you, I go to bed, I can see how much time I have left because I don't have that much time left because they weren't wearing watches. And the skeleton was the reminder of death, that that is the ultimate transition that we all will make. And I thought that little story was pretty telling because the first thing all these monks wanted was a watch. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty cool. So these, these people coming on. Now, many business owners face difficulties running their businesses and decisions regarding business and due to downturns and many of them are sideways right now right i call it sideways they could be burning through cash reserves they have may ha be laying off employees uh, they may be trying to make ends meet whatever that looks like for many business owners throughout the world right now right mom and pop businesses uh, mid-sized businesses what advice would you give these business owners that are faced with these challenges today and how maybe they might be able to literally, I know you can't give specific advice, but you can give general advice, you know, short, pull them up by the bootstraps, as they say. I think it's very easy and natural to think of ourselves on a continuum so that we are trying to preserve what we've created in order to have it have a future. But that's about bringing the past into an imagined future. And that, that can be a very costly exercise. I think what, is, what I would encourage people to do is to use this moment of pause to, to literally do that, to, to stop and recognize that the longer term benefits to their community, to their employees, and to themselves are much more important than the short to medium term ones. In other words, rather than trying to keep your business going as it is, trying to keep your current employees hired as they are, free, just freeze. And in a way, imagine yourself being born again because. That is what we're all being challenged with as an opportunity to create an idea for a business in the future that may be related to what you're doing or may not be related to what you're doing, but has to do with who you are as a founder, what you bring to the table. Because if you can save some resources right now by scaling back drastically and coming to a grinding halt, in order to create something new in the future that will bring opportunity and employment to people, that is so much more valuable than becoming exhausted by trying to stay afloat in this storm. Mm -hmm. If you think of it, metaphors are sometimes helpful. And I think we are all captains of little ships in this storm. And we can do what many people are currently trying to do, which is stay afloat in the storm. Keep sailing, keep going, keep the, keep the sails up, keep the mast up. Or we can take our boats out of the water as fast as we can onto dry land and store them in the knowledge that we may be rebuilding these boats into something that quite different. We may take a large boat and turn it into three boats. We may take a small boat and turn it into a flotation device, but 
what we can't afford to do is get battered and exhausted by the storm itself because right now the future is so uncertain that it's impossible to make plans. The best thing to do is to sit out this time in the cheapest way possible to your business so that you have some resources in order to relaunch when the storm is over. Well, you, along that line, you say uh, that working harder is not going to bring the rewards that most business owners expect. So that's, a, that's a, just a pure fact. You're saying, hey, don't resist the storm. Float back into shore. I get that. And I think that's a great analogy um, because what most people do is put up resistance trying to save what they've got. You know, uh, some, some people might call that pride goeth before the fall you know, because they're very proud of whatever it was they created, the preservation of what they have. Um, they may not have anything left at the end, which would, which would, for most business owners, it's like, okay, I got to get greater sales. I got to get greater profits. So their business is worth more at some point for acquisition, right? You've been in this, you understand how this works. Uh, the greater the margin, the greater the sales, uh, the the greater the uh, uh, the profit of the overall business, the more the EBITDA is, the multiple can go up and people say, oh, great, I just sold this to somebody else for you know five times multiple, 10 times multiple. I don't know. The multiples are crazy. So how would business owners make their company more desirable to a p potential buyer? Let's say there's somebody out there today, Remy, who's like, okay, I still have a viable business, but I'm tired. I just want out and I want to get out of this now. What would you tell them, even if they're not getting the highest price? Because the reality is right now they might not be getting the highest price, but what, what sound advice could you give somebody who's just battered, beat up and said, Hey, I, all I want to do is sell my boat. <laughs> well, I don't want to take my boat to shore. I want to sell it and I'm going to retire or I'm not even going to retire. I'm just going to take the money and contemplate for a while. So I think you basically wrote the answer for me in the way that you framed the question, because if as the founder, you are exhausted and you're beat up and you're tired and you just want out, then doing anything other than getting out will be detrimental to the business and detrimental to you. And Obviously, I coach founders of content companies where the founder themselves, who's often the creative powerhouse behind the company, is hugely important to the business. You can't really divorce the founder of a content company from the value of the company. However, even if you're a company that just sells widgets, if you're the founder and you're running the business and you're exhausted, you won't be making the best decisions for that business. You won't be maximizing the potential of that business. And what I always say to founders when they're exiting is the important thing to recognize is your value, your value as a leader, as a founder, as a human being, your value as a human being with a lifespan that's limited and preserving your health, your mental health, creating the possibility of a future for you with another business, as a leader of another business, that is so much better than going down with the boat because you're too proud. And you called it pride, but, and it is in a sense, of course, Greg, but you know, we all have egos and it's very, very easy to get attached. Yep. It's very, very easy to feel like I am this company. I would be nothing without this company. Without this company, who am I? However, it's really important, not just when you're coming to exit, but at every stage of a founder's evolution, to always remind yourself that the success of the business, the failure of the business does not correlate to your success or failure. Who you are as a leader, who you are as a partner, who you are as an employer is not defined by whether your business sells 10 times more widgets or 10 fewer times widgets. So yeah. to be detached is really, really important. And that perhaps will help that um, imaginary founder who we were talking about, make that decision about getting out now. Because bringing your ship onto dry ground while there's storm weathers is 
is the only sane and sensible thing to do. To try and weather this storm is impossible. You're quite right about the multiples that uh, define a company's value at exit. And yet any buyer will look at this year and next year and the year after that as an inevitable dip. In normal circumstances, if you're you know, turning over 20 million, 30 million, 40 million, and you go down to 1 million, that would be a disastrous story for a buyer. But in this market, we expect it. You would have done a miracle to, to be turning over 1 million in many sectors, which have ground to a halt. Well, I like the old Buddhist saying, and he said, there's suffering and then there's the end of suffering. And the suffering frequently is as a result of attachment uh, to something. So when you have this attachment to what your ego is attached to, as you said, and I think that's very important, you have that suffering, right? And so those are very important things to remember. And in your webinar, you speak about a client you worked with named Annie. And I was particularly looking at your, your 40 minute webinar video who owned a talent agency. And I wanted you to speak about the particulars of this case, because I think sometimes case analysis, case study, really help people understand um, what business owners go through and how you can help them make better decisions about what they're doing. Yeah, so all of this is so interrelated. Um, the, the point that Annie makes beautifully uh, as a case study is the point that many business owners and founders, we focus on projects, we focus on orders, we focus on the needs and demands that are thrown to our business by clients. And what we tend to sometimes ignore at our peril is the business of business itself, the well-being, the welfare of the company that we run. And Annie uh, ran a talent, well, she still does, runs a talent agency representing actors and TV presenters. And she herself is an agent and had been for many years. And she was growing her business, but she grew her business almost exclusively by employing other agents. And what she didn't have was anyone in her business who was actually taking care of her business. She had nine, 10, 15 people who were all agents taking care of the client's needs. Even the office manager was someone who wanted to be an agent and was agenting on the side. And Annie herself, instead of being the managing director who only took care of the business, also was an agent. So you had all these people who were working on projects, servicing clients, and hardly anyone internally who was dedicated to the well-being of the promotion of the business, making sure they attended fairs, making sure clients' external suppliers were paid on time, promoting what they did on social media, because they were all focused on the needs of their clients. And once Annie made this transition to understanding that Yes, she should still do what she loved, which in her case was being an agent, but she had to devote at least 50% of her time to taking care of the people who worked for her, mm -hmm. not people who were her clients, but her team, her staff, and making sure that the business that she ran was working as efficiently and in as streamlined a way as the business that she was taking care of for her clients. You know, there's that saying that the, the shoemaker's children have no shoes and the butcher's children have no meat. And I think with businesses, it's often our own business that gets neglected. And so now she's employed people in her business who don't want to be agents. They just want to be office manager or administrator or whatever it is she needs. She has given 50% of her time to take care of the business. And it's a much more thriving enterprise. Um, and of course, the clients are better served too. So it's really, really important to recognize that whatever business you're in, the biggest project you'll ever have is your company itself. Well, and a, and a point well taken because, you know, it, I love the little story. You have lots of little stories in that webinar with other clients as well. And I want my listeners to know that in Stand Out, that's what you're going to get is some very high quality content because that's all that Remy knows how to produce. Uh, and so it's an opportunity for you to learn. Now, you speak about defining your niche, and this was something I talked a little bit about earlier, which was focus. 
and the importance of focus um, in your course, right? This is the standout course. Um, what have you learned about focus? Because you had a huge failure when you didn't focus. <laughs> and how important is it to know your niche? You know, um, uh, there's a question coming up here about your gay, straight, and taken series that you did. Um, but you, this, this really just uh, illuminates how important it is to have a niche. Well, this is something that all clients struggle with because, you know, it's terrifying to say, I only serve Arab women living in London or mm -hmm. I only serve 16 year old boys. It's terrifying because you think, how many Arab women are there in London or how many 16 year old boys who like computer games are there? And yet, until we define our niche in a really clear and narrow way, we end up serving everyone very badly. Because if you're trying to communicate to everyone, you communicate to nobody. If I'm sending out a message which is, for everybody, then that 16 year old boy who wants computer games is not going to feel like I'm speaking to him. So understanding who you're serving and what you, what you do best is, is absolutely vital. It is scary, but I'll give you an example. In my case, when I came into coaching, I thought I would coach everyone in the creative sector, which already seemed quite narrow because the creative sector is the creative sector. It's not other areas of industry um, and yet what I quickly discovered was that even speaking to everybody who was a leader in the creative sector was not nearly narrow enough and now I say I am only a coach for the founders of content driven businesses which is to say companies which the primary output is ideas so TV programs movies advertising publishing gaming that's all I do. And so when I communicate my messages, I'm speaking to people who feel heard and seen. And your clients have to feel heard and, and seen. When I started out in TV, I also thought I could make TV shows for everyone because I loved watching all kinds of TV programs. Why couldn't I make them? And indeed I could have. It's just about the trust that needs to exist between a company and the client. Because, you know, we trust brands who have a reputation. Like Whole Foods is a very trusted global brand, but you wouldn't go to Whole Foods to have your hair cut, right? Right. So, um, who gets haircuts? Who gets haircuts these days? Well, probably no. Look at, look at mine. I have a guy that comes here and he, <laughs> he has to actually come to the house, you know, and it's like, you know, hair salons. Well, in California, I don't know what it's like in, in London or Kent but they're, they're non-performing businesses right now. Not, no, exactly. So defining your niche is really, really important. And I think if it comes from a place um, that you love and that is fundamentally and authentically you, that's a very good place to start. So my first niche in television was making programs about, I guess we could call them the edges of society at the time. And it's strange to think that just 20 years ago, uh, these were the edges, but, we made the first black music show for British TV. Now black music dominates the charts, but at that time we needed to put it on TV for the first time. We made right. the first show about Asian pop culture. We made the first dating show that you just referenced, uh, where you had to decide whether somebody was single. Gay, gay straight well, or gay taken. Straight or taken. <laughs> you may have seen it, it exported to the States. It was on Lifetime. So, um, we did that because that's who we were. We were a young company in a poor area of London. We uh, employed a diverse range of people. We were ourselves diverse. So we were living on the edges of society, the edges which have since become the middle. And we were making programs about that experience. So I think it's really important that you define a niche that you really understand and love and inhabit and that brings you joy and that you have credibility around because otherwise no one's going to trust you. You become like Whole Foods trying to sell haircuts. Well, 
again, the focus is the most important thing. And I think even Tony Robbins talks about it in uh, his RPM system that he ha has mentioned. Um, uh, so results, purpose, and massive action. And when you define that purpose and you have that vision, you also have created what that niche is. You know where you want to stay. So you're not dancing around everything trying to find it. Now, <clears throat> yeah, you have been on, known to be on what you call the edges. And you speak about one of your shows, which we just talked about, which was Gay, Straight, and Taken. Um, and it, tell us a little about the programming and why knowing that particular niche made you successful. Because you just talked about, you know, the first black musical, the, you know, the gay, straight, and taken, uh, and many others. Because I looked at your list of productions, and it was, it was quite a few. Um, but they all were, as you say, kind of on the edges at the time. 20 years ago, yeah, you know, we, uh, we just in this country have rights in some states, all states, I think it is now, for gays to marry. But for how long did that go on, it debated in the courts and everywhere around the globe? And I guess maybe even in your country. I don't know. But the reality is, is that we are now full engaged in that. And we're full engaged in Black Lives Matters, uh, which is another big thing that's going on in the States right now. Uh, and I think worldwide, because I think that incident actually triggered um, much more focus on that. So you knew your niche, but you were on the edges. <clears throat> and how did you stay relevant on the edges in a time when people weren't as focused on this? Well, in a way, that was an advantage because, you know, now, because it, these things have become worldwide movements and there's much greater awareness about it, um, there are many other companies, even in the TV space, which was my space, who are looking to cater to those segments of society. But when I did it, we were one of the very few. So the very fact that I was able to say to you, we made the first black music show for terrestrial TV. We made the first Asian pop culture show for the BBC. Um, now there's dozens, you know, there's dozens. So in a way we were, we were lucky. There are still tr many trends, which if you inhabit the world that you're delivering to, you will, be aware of before other people. You know, if you're if you're a listener in your 70s, you you'll be watching or listening to what's on offer with a very different awareness of how your market is not being served mm -hmm. because because you're in that market. So I was uh, a young gay Jewish man living in London and so I had that sensibility. So it's two things Greg, I think on the one hand it's what do you understand better than other people because of your experience? And therefore, what are you trusted to deliver more than other people because of your experience? So to give you an example, you know, if I was running my TV production business from my parents' farm in the British countryside, I would have probably done quite well to deliver programs about farming, the environment. Right. Yeah. But how did you, Remy, what do you attribute being able to see around corners? Look, you were, you were a trendsetter. You were at the front end of the arrow, as they say. Um, you know, you were doing things at a time that many people weren't. Now, they would say that that is the ability to kind of see around corners. You can see what's coming. You, you, you're looking at trends. And I wrote a book called Hacking the Gap from Intuition to Innovation and Beyond. And I recognize that intuition is one of the biggest things that an entrepreneur could develop. If you look at Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and Steve Jobs, they'll all talk about intuition. Yet they don't ever maybe give the entrepreneur what exactly that is. What was that intuition that talked to you and you were able to listen to that said, hey, Remy, go down this road. And I believe if you go down this road, it, it's going to be a, a better path. 
Well, I sometimes think it's interesting to try and to try find and another word for something, because when we look at the other words for it, we have a different and perhaps sometimes deeper understanding. So instead of the word intuition, um, I would like to have I would like to offer two new distinctions. One is perspective, mm -hmm. so the perspective that we bring to something, which is often often seems unique to us. And the second is trust in one's humanity. And that may sound odd, but here's the thing. Um, I had the perspective of someone who was living on the edge of social change, social mobility, as a gay man, as a Jewish man in, in Britain at that time. And I had the trust to believe that I wasn't alone, that my experience was more universal than I thought. Because here's the thing, and you know, the digital age has proved this. Um, it used to be that if you were someone who loved long-haired chihuahuas living, yeah. <laughs> in, living in Iowa, you might have been the only person in your village or town who had any interest in long-haired chihuahuas, right? But if you had the trust to believe that there are other people out there with the same passions and interests as you, in this digital age, you discover that sure enough, they are there. And with TV, it was no different. We put out, we made programs that we would love to have watched ourselves. Programs that we not only wanted to make, but wanted to watch. Mm -hmm. And we have the trust to, from that perspective to believe there must be millions of other people just like us. And you know what? There were. And there always are. We think we're very alone in our little bubbles, but there are always millions of people like you. I, my client, Jamila, who uh, had this business catering exclusively to the needs of Arab, affluent Arab women like herself, she thought at the time, well, there can't be that many women just like me. I can't make a business just for people like me. But with the right coaching and support and confidence, she did. And she discovered that, you know what? There are hundreds of thousands of affluent Arab women just like her who needed someone to offer the services she was offering and were delighted that she was there. So it, it's not just intuition or looking around corners. I think it's about the perspective that each of us brings and the trust we have in the fact that there are going to be millions of people just like us. Well, on that, pulling this interview all the way to a wrap, I want to talk about something that had to have been part of your DNA, and that is creativity. And I always wonder, you know, um, we had a gentleman on who wrote a book called The Spark and the Grind. And the spark is the creativity, but the grind is to actually turn the creativity into something, right? Um, and Eric is a very unusual guy. He had lost everything and then went on stage and started, wasn't even an artist, drawing, and literally attracted hundreds of thousands of people uh, to, um, to his work, his books. Unthink was one of them. Uh, the other one is The Spark and the Grind. And I'm thinking about you in this context because creativity and developing something in a market, like you said, hey, park your boat. But now I'm parked my boat. But how do I best use this time where I have time to contemplate? But I never was super creative. Let's say the person wasn't. But I was good at the grind. Okay. What advice would you give to people to spark the creativity uh, during this time where they're maybe in a pause and then to start to develop that into something? Yeah, so there's so many different kinds of creativity and I, I personally believe that everyone is creative. I believe everyone has the capacity to generate. I, have, I believe everyone has the capacity to imagine and I think in many markets, it's really just about listening and receiving and absorbing. You know, creativity is such a active, the idea of, 
being a creator, you, you sort of imagine a painter throwing paint at the canvas and it's quite a in action, masculine thing. But there's another kind of creativity, which is just sitting and waiting for ideas to come to you through your friends, through your family, through people who you know. They'll tell you what they need. They'll tell you what they want. They'll tell you what they're looking for. And if you have a business that's on the ground right now, talk to your clients and talk to your clients, partners, and talk to your associates and find out what they think. No sense to you because if someone says something that you think, you know what, that's a really good idea. Most ideas come from other people and most entrepreneurs, just like writers, take other people's stories and turn them into novels. Most entrepreneurs take something that they heard, something they observed that made sense to them as a potential client and then they action it. So I think it's so much more important to be good at the grind because my experience is lots of people have ideas. There are many too many ideas out there. What there's very few of is people who are able to follow through with a plan and make it happen. Execute people on are, it. Yeah. Execute on it. Yeah. yeah. And your course is about your standout course. And so now I want to, I want to state this. Where is the best place that the individuals watching this show, because we're going to put links in the blog and we're going to do all that. Um, I have a link, but is it just stand out? No, they should go to remyblumenfeld.com. Okay, so. And it's, it's difficult to spell, but it's R-E-M-Y, like okay. the cognac. B-L-U-M. B-L-U-M-E-N-F-E-L-D, Remy Blumenfeld. And if you go to remyblumenfeld.com, you will find information about Standout and other coaching packages that I offer. But I think Standout is a wonderful basis on which to envision a new business, grow your existing business. And it really approaches parts of entrepreneurship, which I was never taught. I worked with the London Business School on a program about entrepreneurship and none of this was in their program because it's about the mental mindset of being a leader and how to overcome your blind spots and how to do the things which will make the most money, which often our ego is holding us back from doing. I'll give you one very short example of what I'm talking about. Um, when we sell a business, often our ego is attached. We want the buyer to think that we did the most with this business that we could possibly have done, that we explored every opportunity, that we mined for every possible uh, source of revenue. And that's a big mistake because it, makes our, it might be satisfying to our ego, but what it sends to the buyer is a signal that they can't do more with the business than we did. Because right. if they think, oh, this guy's very smart, he's probably done as well as anyone could do with this business. Then they look at the business as a crystallized entity and they think, well, that, it is what it is. If they think, oh, this guy's pretty, not so good at business, he's left out a lot of things that he could have done. There's a lot of opportunities he didn't explore. We are quite smart. We, the buyer, are quite smart. We could do much better with his business than he's done. That makes them much more excited to buy the business. It's like if you go and look at a house and they say, oh, we've explored every opportunity to extend and we can't extend. You're less excited by the house than if they say, oh, we never looked to see whether we could put another floor above. So very sound advice, Remy. And what I'm going to do is put a link in to this uh, as well as we'll put a link into uh, your Forbes magazine article as well, so people could read that. Um, but again, as Remy mentioned, uh, there's a course here, and where you're going to want to do is www.remyblumenfeld.com is where you're going to want to go. And then at the top of there, you're going to see program. Uh, you can push on that, it will take you to the programs. All that will be in our blog entries as well. Um, and Remy, it's been a pleasure having you on Inside Personal Growth, spending a few minutes with our listeners talking about standout, talking about 
how you help coach uh, medium-sized small business owners uh, to actually find the opportunities within their own businesses to grow, succeed, and more importantly, be happy themselves. And I think that is a big element, is helping individuals understand that even while they're struggling with this on one side of struggle uh, is happiness. And so that's, that's actually how you learn. That's how you grow. Um, and, you know, I guess that old saying, no pain, no gain. <laughs> there is some truth to that, obviously. Uh, any final parting words, Remy? Uh, Greg, it's been a joy talking with you the other side of the world. And I hope that your listeners got something from this too. I've really enjoyed your questions and I'm standing by to answer your listeners' questions. So thank you so much and namaste to you. And we will part here. Thanks for being on the show, Remy. Thank you.